The Parnell Panther was a carrier-based spotting and reconnaissance aircraft, which was designed during the First World War, and it was one of the first aircraft to be fully designed and built by manufacturer Parnell, then known as Parnell & Sons. It would also be the company's most successful aircraft, with a long production run of both domestic and export models. That being said, though it was designed at Parnell, the majority of the 155 Panthers built would not be produced by them at all, but were instead built by the Bristol Aeroplane Company. But more on that later. The Panther was produced in response to a specification issued by the British Admiralty in 1917. Specification AD slash N2A called for a two-seat reconnaissance and spotting aircraft, and one that could operate from this newfangled thing called an aircraft carrier. It was designed by Admiralty designer Harold Bolas. To meet the specifications, Bolas introduced some innovative elements into the N2A structure. The fuselage was designed with wooden monocoque construction, drawing on Bolas's previous experience with the AD flying boat and navy plane, and considerable care was put into the design to make it suitable for a harsh life at sea, where rough weather and limited supplies were the norm. Airbags were installed in the rear section of the fuselage to provide buoyancy in case the aircraft had to ditch in the sea, and for ease of maintenance, the instrument panels in both of the cockpits were designed to hinge open to allow easier access. Another interesting feature was the method used for storing the Panther aboard an aircraft carrier, and it's a feature that would crop in and out of various designs over the next 10 to 20 years. The rear fuselage section, located just behind the observer's cockpit, was hinged so that it could swing out parallel to the starboard main wings, essentially splitting the aircraft in half. Because of this, all of the tail unit's control cables had to be placed in a special protected channel on the fuselage's starboard side. The fuselage itself was constructed in two main sections. Each section used plywood formers, onto which an outer layer of plywood with fabric covering was screwed and glued. The entire structure was supported by a frame of four longerons, and these longerons not only held the plywood formers, but also provided reinforced points for the fuselage's folding areas. The pilot's cockpit was located just below the upper centre section, directly above the main fuel tank. Entry through an opening in the upper wing centre section was somewhat cumbersome. This required lowering a part of the wing trailing edge, hinged to the rear spar, and dropping oneself down into the seat. Now, apparently, if the pilot wasn't quite accurate with this, it sometimes resulted in accidental bruising to certain sensitive areas. Plum squashing aside, this awkward design feature did have a unique benefit in that it offered the pilots an excellent overhead view. Moreover, when flying, the aircraft in general provided an exceptional all-round view as well, which was particularly beneficial for carrier landing. The first prototype of the N2A, known as N91, was ready for its initial trials in April of 1918. It was powered by a 230 horsepower Bentley BR2, which was an air-cooled 9-cylinder rotary engine. It was in fact one of the most powerful rotary aero engines produced in large quantities. It was housed in a convex cowling, which was radially divided and open at the bottom, and this design not only improved airflow, but also helped to reduce drag during flight. Along with having a fairly potent engine, at least as far as naval aircraft went during this time period, it was also quite well armed. The prototype was equipped with a fixed 303 calibre Vickers machine gun on the port side of the pilot's cockpit, and in the rear cockpit, the Observer also had a 303 calibre Lewis gun which was mounted on a pillar. This particular arrangement did not last very long, as it was viewed that the Panther would not be used in any real offensive role, and the 303 calibre machine gun available to the pilot would be removed for subsequent prototypes and the production model. Despite going on to be a very successful design, the Panther's initial trialling period was anything but successful. During the manufacturer's trials, the prototype was discovered to be very nose-heavy, a suboptimal trait for something designed to take off from the deck of a carrier at sea. The last thing you really wanted was your naval fighter to spear into the cold ocean. Understandably, this was something of a major problem, and before it went for its official trials at Mardlesham Heath in May of 1918, the prototype underwent modifications. 
These included the installation of horn-balanced elevators, and a significant increase in the forward slope of the hinge lines to correct the problem. Unfortunately, the trials at Mardisham Heath were also something of a disappointment. The aircraft's top speed of 105 miles an hour at 2,000 feet, and its ability to climb to that altitude in 2 minutes and 20 seconds, showed only a slight improvement over earlier aircraft that had much less power. Despite this, the decision was made to continue the development, as in general the airframe did show some promise. This would result in the development of five more prototypes. By the summer of 1918, the first three of these had been completed, and underwent tests with Parnell's newly designed flotation gear. This gear, considered essential for an airplane operating mainly over the sea, included airbags placed beneath the lower wings, in addition to those that were built into the aircraft's rear fuselage. Unfortunately, photos of these prototypes are somewhat scarce, so for this next little section of the video, the photos you'll see on the screen will be prototypes, but they might not always necessarily be the prototype in which I am referring to. On the 22nd of June 1918, the second prototype was sent to Turnhouse in Edinburgh for fleet trials, and was later taken aboard the battlecruiser HMS Repulse. This was to test the aircraft's takeoff from a small platform attached to one of the ship's main gun turrets, which was a common practice for launching naval scouting aircraft at the time. The third prototype was finished in July of 1918, and, equipped with Parnell's new flotation gear, was sent to the Isle of Grain Naval Experimental Station for ditching trials. These trials were completely successful, with the aircraft landing at a very low speed, gliding smoothly on the hydrovane, and settling on the water without any damage. Meanwhile, the fourth prototype went to the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough for landing tests. The fifth aircraft was sent back to Turnhouse to participate in trials with the fleet and in experiments with the grain flotation gear. The sixth and final prototype was fitted with modified flotation gear, an upgraded hydrovane, and two additional handling positions on the fuselage to allow the crew better and easier access to their cockpits. This prototype was officially named the Panther, and it could be considered the template for the subsequent production models. Parnell was initially awarded two contracts to build 312 Panthers in total. However, following the armistice in November 1918, the second contract was cancelled. This cancellation caused some friction between Avery, who was Parnell's controlling group, and the Air Ministry. Said friction led to backroom squabbling, and apparently one or two insults may have been traded between senior members of the ministry, and this led to the cancellation of both of the Panther contracts. The first order was then later revised, and offered instead to the British and Colonial Aeroplane Company at Filton, which later became Bristol Aeroplane. The order for the Bristol-built 150 Panthers was fulfilled between 1919 and 1920, and the first aircraft joined the British fleet aboard the aircraft carriers HMS Argus and HMS Hermes. Here, the Panthers were instrumental in the early development of deck handling, takeoff, and landing practices, and they also aided in the development of various forms of arrestor gear. They were initially fitted with unique fasteners on their undercarriage axles, which connected to longitudinal wires on the carrier deck. These wires served as both guidelines and as a friction braking system, working in tandem with transverse hinged wooden barriers to slow the aircraft during landing. Though it looked good on paper, this setup often led to damage during said landings. In fact, during one training session aboard HMS Argus in 1924, almost all of the landing attempts resulted in damage to the aircraft, the carrier deck, the carrier deck landing systems, or all three. Due to the high cost of the damages, as things had to be repaired all the time, this landing system was eventually replaced with an older method using ropes and weights, whilst other systems were reviewed and evaluated. The Panther was in service with the Royal Navy long enough that it received several modifications. These included the fitting of larger horn-balanced rudders, oleotype undercarriage legs, a wider undercarriage track which improved stability on landing, and improved hooks for the deck landing cables. 
Additionally, several Panthers, which had been mildly damaged, were refurbished under contract, with 18 going to the Gloucester Aircraft Company in 1923, and it is also believed, according to some source materials, that a small number of Panthers were also refurbished by the newly established George Parnell Company in Bristol. Besides serving aboard HMS Argus and HMS Hermes, Panthers were also used by shore-based units. This included Number 421 Fleet Spot of Reconnaissance Flight at Gosport, as well as Numbers 441 and 442 Fleet Spot of Reconnaissance Flights, and Number 406 Fleet Fighter Flight. During its service, the Panther earned a mostly favourable reputation. Pilots found it enjoyable to fly, with few drawbacks, except for some issues with the rudder control at slow speeds, and the Panther's Bentley engine, which required frequent adjustments to maintain adequate power, something that could be a bit of a challenge to manage during flight. Captain Norman McMillan, a renowned test pilot of that era, spoke very favourably of his experiences with the Panther, and maintenance crews also had very few complaints as well, apart from those about the engine. The Panther also caught the attention of foreign naval forces as well, particularly the United States Navy and the Imperial Japanese Navy. The US Navy ordered two Panthers, designated as A5751 and A5752. These were assigned to the US Naval Flying Corps, and they were fitted with the same 230 horsepower Bentley engines, the same hydrovanes, and the same flotation gear used on the British production models. Unfortunately, not a great deal is known about their specific service in the United States, but they were shipped out in 1920 and they spent most of their time being used on various carrier launching and deck handling trials. Similarly, the Imperial Japanese Navy, aiming to enhance its own naval aviation capabilities, received advice from a British air mission led by William Forbes Sempill, aka Lord Sempill, aka Colonel the Master of Sempil in 1921. This led to the Japanese Navy ordering various British aircraft, which included 12 Parnell Panthers equipped with horn-balanced rudders. These served with the Japanese fleet at their base in Yokosuka for an unknown number of years. Despite having some limitations, and despite being relatively obscure in aviation circles today, the Panther played a significant role in advancing carrier deck flying techniques in the Royal Navy at the end of the 1910s, moving into the 1920s. This had a direct impact on the development of carrier-borne strike aircraft, which later became crucial in naval warfare, and it provided a wealth of data towards the development of aircraft flotation systems and air-sea rescue operations for both naval fighter crews and aircraft carrier crews. The Panthers would remain in service with the fleet air arm until 1926, when they were finally replaced by the Ferry 3D. As always, thank you all so much for watching. And a big thank you, of course, to the Patreon supporters. And would you look at that, I managed to upload two videos in the space of a week, I think. I think that's the first time I've managed that for uh, quite a while. Long may it continue. Uh, I've got a couple of really long videos in the pipes at the moment. I'm hoping to get the first one of those uploaded and done maybe by next weekend. I'm currently editing at the moment, but I might need to make a few revisions because I'm not quite happy with the audio quality. So p potentially stand by for that. A big thank you, of course, to our Wing Commander tier patrons, our highest tier supporters. And for those of you who have been asking recently, yes, the deep dive videos are finally making a return. I am currently working on one. Research is underway on about four others at the moment, pending getting some documents scanned. So hopefully there should be a couple out before Christmas. Um, they do take some time. It's a lot of research work. And I think some of these are going to be one and a half to two hours long, depending. So they might even be two parters, sort of like I had on the Curtis P40 video. But anyway, that is stuff for the future. Thank you all so much for your continued support. And as always, I will catch you all next time. Goodbye.